in nature today and that you can apply in your business uh, as and when you need. I'm going to open the floor at the end to Q&A, but please feel free just to, to butt in and ask questions along the way. I tend to speak fairly quickly, so um, bear with me. So before I get into what the eight layer strategy is, I think it's important to often just ask the question, so you know, why, why do we need strategy and what is strategy? And the reason why I'm giving this, this, this webinar, the reason why I talk about the subject matter is um, when I'm helping clients, what I tend to find is a lot of the clients think they're being strategic when in actual fact they're only doing these sort of actions in their business or the reverse where they, they tend to spend a lot of time talking about the long-term goals and, and the big ambitions they have but they have no tangible plan of like, what are they going to do today, tomorrow, the next week or two to get the plan off the ground and actually go out and do the work that needs to be done. So when you start producing a strategy, the first thing you've got to bear in mind is that it is only a plan. And it's a plan which outlays a departure point. Where are you today? Where are we going from here? As well as obviously some long-term goals. I subscribe to long-term, mid-term, short-term goals. And we'll get into that through, this, through the canvas. But the other way I want you to think about strategy is potentially something along the lines of, of a, a, a Google, Google Maps or a GPS system. Um, when you get into an Uber or when you get into using your car and using Google Maps, um, it always asks or has to know where you are in order to plan the route to get to where you're going. So the first part of deciding on, on your strategy is to actually understand what today and your environment and your business and your mindset looks like before you can start planning your goals and where you want to get to and then decide the route by which you want to get there. Now, there's a great saying that says that no strategy survives impact with the enemy, which means that the plan, as soon as you start engaging with the enemy and the enemy being your staff, the market, your clients, SARS, uh, COVID, all things that come along and, and disrupt the plan, um, your plan needs to be flexible enough to adapt and change and be panel beated potentially to adjust to the current environment of that time always keeping the long-term goal sort of in mind. And um, the, the other thing which is important to remember is that, is that if you are lucky enough not to be in an, or to be in an environment where there is no competition, you don't need to plan as much because generally strategy is produced when there is a need to have a plan against the opposition. And, and, and my favorite story of this was the, the Mark Tyson, the Evander Holyfield fight many years ago, and maybe I'm showing my age here, but you know, but both two professional boxers, plan for months, a lot of fitness and training, um, spend a lot of time watching at, watching the opposition's historical games to understand how to fight these, how to fight the battle. Um, and the two, these two giants get in the, in the, in the ring. And at some point in the fight, Mark Tyson took a bite out of Evander Holyfield's ear. And at that point, both their strategies went out the window. So again, it's a plan um, that needs to uh, uh, include where the rubber hits the road. So right down to the granular level, um, as well as the fact that it needs to be adaptable and you need to be able to measure it to make sure that, that you keep checking, what are we doing? Is it working? How well is it working? Where is it failing? So we can panel beat it to keep it relevant to what we're trying to do. The one other thing which I think is important is to remove legacy thinking from our, our narrative in our business. So a lot of businesses that have been around for a long time um, kind of like the Zimbabweans, the Zimbabweans, we, we refer to them as the, the when we, when we were there. And often it's about, well, you know, before COVID, we used to do this and no longer relevant. So make sure that you're always approaching strategy with a fresh set of eyes, with no sort of uh, existing biases and beliefs, and, and make sure that you're not thinking around some of the legacy problems that you were solving and using the same systems to solve those problems, which may not exist today in your business. So there's a great song by Tom Eslick. It says, you can't sell into the future if you're anchored in the past. And that, for me, speaks to the lazy thinking around, um, around strategy. So ultimately, you're building a strategy to, to help you, the people in your organization, make decisions and allocate resources correctively, corrective, uh, correctly in order to accomplish some kind of long-term key objectives. So it gives the roadmap. It gives guiding principles and rules to help make decisions. And, and should take the people and the business um, towards the desired goals and help them prioritize what they're doing. Now, when we get into strategy um, in terms of the, the eight layer, um, I'm going to share my screen. Um, what, what you often have within most strategies, and this is not necessarily my thinking, this is sort of, sort of traditional strategic thinking, is that there are eight layers to strategy. So generally, it, it, it's based on where are we today, our current situation? 
What are the objectives? What are the goals we want? And those can be broken down into different terms. What are the high level strategies we're going to use to achieve those objectives? So moving us from where we are today towards those goals, what strategies we're going to be using. Then we go down and decide what are the tactics we're going to use. Then we can decide what are the actions, which is the who, what, when, how, what resources are required to do the work. And then the last piece of the six is control and measure, which is around understanding and tracking the success of the implementation of the strategy. Now, working with my clients, I find that that principle still works, but I find that there's two parts that no one's really thought about, especially with owner-run businesses. The first piece is the fact that um, when we start to my business goals, these are goals that we can share with our staff, with our team, with our, our clients, with the market at large. We want to be known for something and achieve something. But often with smaller businesses or owner-run businesses, it's important to, to bear in mind, well, how does the business serve me and satisfy my personal needs? And sometimes those can be quite selfish and they can be egotistical in nature. They can be financial in nature and anything along those lines. But it's the kind of goals that we don't talk about in the public sphere. And we certainly don't use it to motivate our staff to achieve the overall business objective. So there's a piece around sort of your personal victory conditions. What does winning look like for myself? So that's the seventh of a seventh layer, which I've added into the eight layer strategy. And then of course, what happens is that when you start unpacking all the work that needs to be actually done to deliver on a strategy in smaller businesses and, and often down to one man businesses, it's a huge amount of work. And there's no, there's no way that you can do all this work all the time. So we want to then put it into, into like a 12 month plan and prioritize the, the, the low, low effort, high impact work first to make sure that we're starting with stuff that where we can do a little bit of work and make the biggest impacts in our business. And that for me is the eighth layer. So the traditional six layers, plus the fact we want to talk about our personal victory conditions or the owner's victory conditions or the shareholder's mandate. Um, and then obviously the last piece around how do we break out and produce a plan that, that's realistic in delivery um, with regards to what the impact is and the amount of effort that we need to do. So I want to go through the eight layer strategy. It's something that I use to facilitate actual strategy facilitation at, at a greater detail. And it's something that, that I try and teach, uh, try to teach my clients. So those are the eight layers that I discussed with you. So understanding where you are today, your current situation, what are my personal victory conditions as a, as a shareholder or owner in the business? What are the business goals by business vertical? And by vertical, I'm talking about like HR, finance, marketing, operations, those kind of verticals. What are the high level, uh, the, the key strategic initiatives that need to be done? Breaking those initiatives down into, into thrusts, which are the quarterly pieces, many quarters. And those are like uh, the, the initiatives in more detail. We then want to filter these things out into impact versus efforts and break it into those quarters. Look at the, the actual tangible work that needs to be done, and that can be built into a project plan with lots and lots of detail. And then the last piece is the control measurement element. So in order to start this, while we go through the process, um, and all of you will be getting a, a, a copy of this PDF to work from in your own time, you've got to bear in mind that when you start producing strategy, there are often loads of great ideas that come out of the exercise that go through producing a strategy, but sometimes they aren't relevant to the business today. And sometimes they're great ideas for other businesses, but we need a place to put them so we can not forget about them, but make sure that down the line, we can revisit the parking lot and, and, and see which ideas we spoke about in the past that we could possibly implement at a later stage and, and revisit it on a regular basis. So bear in mind is that as you start producing ideas and you can't implement everything, there's a place to put it and that we can call the parking lot. So in order to unpack your current situation, when you're producing strategy, this is the, the area you spend the most amount of time because you have to understand where you are and the environment that you play in in order to move the business forward. So a series of exercises that you can apply in, in, in the first layer. Some of you may have seen or be, uh, you know, been exposed to some of these exercises. Some are very traditional and some may be a little bit left field for you. So the first one I love is a double layered customer window. By double layer, we, we do the exercise twice. We do it first for our business or my business. And the second time we do it for the market at large. So it's made up of four quadrants, kind of like a window. That's why it's called the customer window. And we start with the top left-hand quadrant. And the top left-hand quadrant is within my business, what does my customer want and get from me? Now that is obviously the product or the service, but it may be other things. It could be like access to me. It could be quick turnaround times. It could be short and simple contracts. Uh, it could be great uh, dashboarding or reporting. It's stuff that isn't necessarily directly the product or service that you offer, 
but it's anything the customer wants and gets from my business. Sometimes the customer wants comfort in buying from me. They want to know we're a credible supplier and they get that. So it's around like, are we doing our marketing smartly to give the, the, the client comfort in their, in their decision-making to spend money with us? So what does the customer want and get from our business is the good stuff. That they want it, they get it, it's wonderful. We then move to the right hand, top right hand corner. And this is, what does the customer want and not get from my business? And these are the gaps, right? So sometimes it's stuff we don't want to give to them. We may need to have that, half, that harsh or hard conversation with the client as to why they don't get it. But what does the customer want and not get from us as a business? And spend some time thinking about putting down all the thoughts around these pieces within your business. Then we move to the bottom left-hand corner. So what does the customer not want and get anyway? Now, this is often a lot of where, where clients get really upset because what happens is that you, you're forcing them to do things or read things or sign things which they don't necessarily want. Or what you're doing is that you're producing extra work in your business for the client when they don't actually want it or value it. So the question, why are we doing it still? So what does the customer want? Uh, what does the customer not want, but get anyway? And that again, spend some time, put this on a whiteboard or, or, or use the, this, this, sort of, this sort of thinking and just write down as many answers as you want. And often doing it slowly allows you to think about it and percolate it on it and, and add more value to this. And the more information you can put into these, these exercises, the better the outcome of your strategy will be. At the bottom right hand corner is what does the customer not want and does not get and not be too broad about it. So what tends to happen here, and this speaks to, to legacy, is that it, two, three, four, five years ago, you may have provided a service which has slowly died and gone away and the clients don't want it and you've stopped it. And then over time, you bring in new staff and they decide, he has an idea, let's go back and do that old service or product. And you want to make sure that we don't go back and do things that we used to do that don't work for us. So what are the things that the customer no longer wants or does not want from us and make sure that we are not doing it and does not get it. And it's, it's, it's the least of the, of the four blocks, the least important, but just make sure we don't go backwards in our business. So the idea is that you go through all four quadrants around our business as it stands today, not about where we're moving to, what we want to be doing. What does it look like today? We then do the exact same exercise looking at the entire market. So what is the, the customer out there want from our market and get, which means it's a competitive space, it means everyone is doing it, everyone's offering the services, it may become more price sensitive for argument's sake, a little bit of, of red water as in lots of sharks in the water. So what does the customer want to get, uh, and get from the market? Top right and corner, what does the customer want and not get from the market at large? And those are often the opportunities or the gaps which we could fill as a business. So understanding that, and if you don't know the answers, often it's a question of doing some actual research, whether it's interviews or online research or forums, whatever that looks like, um, to try and make sure we, we actually know the answers and not making assumptions around these answers. Same thing for the bottom left-hand corner, customer does not want and gets from the market. That too could be an opportunity or a risk to, to the, the, the market at large. And then the bottom one, again, the least important, what does the customer not want and not get from the market? Now, what I have found, and this is just a, a general rule of how the pace in which you produce your strategy is that, and this is part of the silver linings of COVID, is that prior COVID, strategy facilitation by myself would be done over a day or a day and a half or two days in the room with the people on a whiteboard and we go and do this kind of work. And we were constrained by time. So I would go, guys, you've got five minutes, go answer the top left-hand corner, All right? Thank you. Five minutes, go do the next right-hand corner. And whatever you had available to you in your mind and, and your state of mind is what you would dump onto the board. And that's what we had to work with. With COVID, what's tend to happen is that no one can do two days sitting in front of a screen if it's a virtual facilitation. So it's broken down into multiple two-hour sets. And between the two-hour sets can be two or three days sometimes. And what that allows you to do is revisit the thinking and allows you to percolate and get more detail. And if you don't know the answer, go and do the research to actually make sure you're making informed decisions around the, the assumptions that you, you may have had prior. So the, the reason I'm telling you this is that when you do the, these exercises, don't just sit down for a morning and do it and think it's done. Rather do, do each of the exercises slowly, 
and then revisit them over a couple of days because you'll find that that sometimes there's richer thinking or you'll be in the shower and, and the light goes off and, and you and you have a and it's not load shedding light, the light goes off in, in a good way, and you have great ideas and you can add it to these exercises in order to make your thinking richer. <clears throat> so this is the first exercise that I would go through to establish what the current situation looks like. Once we've gone through these, what we're looking for are the themes, the common themes. So what are we doing that's working? What are we doing that's not working? And then try and pack out some of the common themes that sit across the market as well as our business from the client and keep these common themes on a separate board. Just write down what they are. And they can be things like the client gets lots of love from us or doesn't get lots of love for us. Or we're really good at doing the finance piece or we're really bad at billing or we're really bad at collecting money. Um, or you know we're bad at marketing or bad at upselling. Whatever those things are that come out of the exercise, put them down in a separate place, common themes of the customer window, and then we'll revisit it towards the end. The next exercise, which is also fairly common, is a very simple start, stop, and keep. And this is generally done with the entire business in mind, and it fits across all elements of the business. And I'm talking about your role. So what do you do in the business, your department or your team, the greater business at large, and sometimes even the industry that you play in. You can be broad with your thinking, and sometimes imagine that you've got a magic wand that you could just do the exercise without the constraints of time or money. So the first piece that you would do is that on the left-hand side is things we need to start doing. So what things do not exist in your business today that if you could just start doing them today, forget about money because we can solve for money in time, we can solve for time. What things don't exist today that we need to start doing immediately? And then write down on, on post-it notes for argument's sake, one thought per post of notes, as many post of notes as you need. Just dump all your thoughts down, what we would love to start doing. And then once you've done that, try and separate them into a priority of, of high priority versus low priority. So which are the things that are, are, are important, which can have the biggest impact in your business versus low priority, which would be nice to have, but isn't going to really you know, move the needle of the business. We then move to the middle, the middle section. The middle section is things we need to stop doing. So what things exist in our business today that if I could wave the magic wand, we could immediately just stop doing. Um, and similar thing, write down as many thoughts as you want and allow some time to percolate thoughts and to add to this. So what things do you want to stop doing in the business by, by vertical of the business, i.e. finance, marketing, product and service or anything else, my role, the, the greater market, our clients, anything you want to stop doing, write it down. It's a wish list. Okay, it's a wish list or maybe even a bit of a bitch list. Like, what are, we, what are we bitching about and moaning about? And the last thing is, is it generally the good stuff? So what are the things that exist in my business that we should be doing more of and we need to keep doing more of in the business? So once you've done all three exercises, try and see if there are common themes. Again, the common themes talk to things like account management or finance or quality or delivery or missing deadlines or anything along those lines. What are those themes for each of the start, stops, and keeps. And once you've mapped out all of those themes, try and find the common themes across this exercise. And what you may start seeing is those common themes actually are quite similar to the common themes of the customer window. So again, spend some time, dump all your answers down, and slowly but surely, almost through some, some kind of funnel, sift these answers down to find the common themes. The SWOT analysis, I'm sure you've all seen at some point, what I've done is I've added two more T's to SWOT, so it's got you know, an extra two T's on the end there. So we have the internal factors such as strengths and weaknesses. We have the external factors like opportunities and threats. And then we have general trends within the marketplace. And then sometimes we have technology factors that can impact our business. So you spend some time thinking about, well, what are the strengths of our business? And often that's, you know, it's, it's our strength, it's our abilities, it's our networks, it's our technologies. Um, it's our credibility, our years of service, whatever that is, strong contracts. What are the strengths in our business that exist today? And what are the weaknesses that exist today in our business? Then you go up to the opportunities. So what are the opportunities at large? And I'm not talking about the short-term sales opportunities. I'm not talking about your pipeline. What can we close tomorrow? I'm talking about the general opportunities that may be coming out where the world has changed and there's gaps, as you can see, in the market that you could possibly fill. So what are those opportunities? And then what are the threats that are out there big, small, and medium, and generally threats that you can sort of see coming. Like, like no one saw COVID coming. Um, very few businesses that I deal with saw COVID coming or ever, ever thought about pandemic being a threat to their business. And sometimes 
pandemic turned out to be an opportunity, not necessarily a threat. So it depends on which side of the fence, what kind of business you have. Try and analyze that. Do the same thing with the trends. So what are the big trends that, that you should be watching that may affect your business that could turn into opportunity or turn into threat? And what are those technology factors that you could jump on that could make your business better or worse that could, you could add to your strength or if you're not adopting, could become a weakness in your business? And once you've done this exercise, the idea is to then move into the, the bottom right-hand corners and work out what are the strategies or, or the ideas that you could use to, to leverage your strengths, to take advantage of opportunities, to leverage your strengths, to prevent the threats, to make use of strategies to, to find those opportunities to, to limit the weaknesses and um, strategies to, to minimize the potential dangers lying in the sectors where you are weak, which may lead to a threat in your business. So a very simple, uh, old fashioned in, in nature, but still incredibly powerful if you do it. The next one is generally taken from Michael Porter's, Porter's Fire Forces. Um, what I tend to find with smaller businesses, unfortunately, is that, is that when we, the fifth force, which isn't on this, this worksheet, is around competitor analysis. And in smaller businesses, it's actually very difficult to know how many opposition there are out there, what they are actually doing in the business, how much do they charge, what their business model is. So what we tend to do that is we make a lot of assumptions around that, and those assumptions can actually be quite dangerous. So I've left it off as, as one of the forces in this exercise. But what I want to focus on are the other four of the five forces that, that exist. Again, this is not my thinking. This is from Michael Porter, who's one of the godfathers of, of strategy and lectures at, at, at Harvard. So the top left, um, the first piece of the exercise is to understand the threats of new entrants. And what this speaks to is generally within the business, what kind of defensive moats do you have in your business? So how difficult is it for anybody who's not in your industry to enter your industry? Like, are there barriers to entry? Is there, are there compliance issues or education issues or money issues or government policy issues? Like, what are the things that, that stop people coming into your space or is it very easy to do? And, and I'll give you two very simple opposing examples. Is that if you wanted to start a small social media agency to manage business, all you actually need is, is probably a, a cell phone. You don't even need a website necessarily. You could start a business just with WhatsApp and a cell phone, and off you go, and you could start being a freelancer and start a business. Very little barriers to entry, very little constraints. You don't really need a business. You don't need compliance. You don't need to belong to an association. You could just start the business, right? So in there, high level of threat of entrance. And on the opposing scale, it could be something like mining. In order for an individual to start mining, you need lots of money, lots of government compliance, lots of structures and, and people, and it's not an easy thing just to start doing. So difficult to get into mining, easy to get into social media management, right? So the idea is understand where do you fit on that scale with the business so that you can start thinking about how do you build a defensible moat around your business to keep opposition out of the space that you're playing in. So the questions you ask yourself are, what are those barriers to entry? Are there economies of scale by, by doing more of this kind of work in the space you're in? How loyal are the, the clients to you or can they switch easily? Do you need a lot of money to join or, or start this kind of business? Do you need to be experienced? I mean, if you want to become a brain surgeon, you can't just be a brain surgeon. You need experience. You need to be trained and educated and go through the process to get that experience. So that's a barrier. Um, again, sometimes as government policies can be things like BEE policies, right through to other kinds of policies. Um, and then is it difficult to find distribution for your product or service? Again, if you if distribution from a cell phone, if you're running social media, very easy. Distribution for a mining, very difficult. Um, and then again, for clients to leave their current supplier or leave you, what are the switching costs? Is it mostly headache or is there actual money that needs to be spent to leave someone and join you? Uh, or vice versa. So you try and rank your threat of new entrants sort of from, from a high to low perspective. Moving to the right is the bargaining power of buyers. These are your customers, right? So how many customers do you have? Do you have power over those customers? Are you dependent on one or two? Or if are there so many clients out there that if you lose one or two, it's not the end of the world. If, if there's only one or two clients that will buy from you, they have power over you, not the situation you want to be in. How big are those customers? So obviously, you know, if you've got lots of small clients, okay. If you've got one or two big clients, a bit of a risk to your business. What's the difference between the competitors that are fighting for you, the different kinds of customers you've got, and, and to try to work out whether there's very little differentiator out there or whether there's a hard differentiator. 
How sensitive are your customers to price? So if, if they are, will they move around for a couple of cents? Or if not, will they stick around you and pay a premium price? What is their ability to change? So how easy is it to change? And what is their switching costs again to swap you out for somebody else? Moving down to the bottom right. So suppliers, not every business has suppliers in their business, but larger organization will have suppliers. Suppliers could also be freelancers or staff to some degree in your business. So are there lots of people that can supply you or not? The more people that can supply you, the more leverage you have over them. If there's only one or two guys that supply you what you need, they have power over you, that's a bad place to be. So how many customers do they have, right? How unique is their, their product towards you? Again, if, if it's very unique and hard to find, you aren't in a position of power. And this the whole idea here is which forces do you have? How much power do you have? How much um, does it cost to swap suppliers? So your switching costs. And how easy is it for you to actually substitute the suppliers in your business? Um, and again, think of suppliers at anything you're spending money on in the business from staff to actual physical supply of product or services in your business. Um, and then the last piece is substitute products. So what products out there give your client the same results, but in a different delivery method? So example being is that I could catch a bus to get from A to B. I can catch an Uber to get from A to B. I can catch a, a bicycle from A to B. Those are all products or services that get me from A to B. How many other products or services out there which aren't the same as you get your client the same results, right? So how many are there? Are there lots of them? Are they available? How likely are your clients to swap out between the two? Is there a massive price point between your service and the substitute? Is there a big perceived level of differentiation as opposed to a real level of differentiation? And again, the last question is, are they switching costs? Once you look at this, you can then realize that you might be very strong with one or two elements, or you need to, need, need to renegotiate some uh, contracts, or actually change the model by which you're delivering your product or service to have more power. Now, in an ideal world, you want to be playing in a place where there are very little opposition, that in order to do what you do, it's very difficult to get into the, into the space or the game that you play that you've got a huge amount of power over your clients because they don't have a choice to buy anywhere. You have a huge amount of power over your suppliers because they need your business. And there's very few substitute products out there. If you are weak in all four or five of these forces, you're in a very competitive, very dangerous place. And it's probably a bit of a race to the bottom and may need to think about changing your services completely. The next piece, which is a full day exercise, we're going to roll down into a two minute conversation is basically a value proposition. I want you to think about what it is that you do in three different layers. On the left-hand side, we have our product or our service, my product, my service, my business. And on the other side, we have your client or your, your customer. So the top layer is the very basics for your business. The client has a problem they're trying to solve, and you've got a product or service that's going to help them solve that problem. Without that, you have no business. So what is the problem they're trying to solve, or multiple problems they're trying to solve in their business? And what is the solution that you have that solves their product possibly in a unique way? Now, most businesses, all businesses have to have that. If you don't have that, you don't have a business. Some businesses only survive in that top layer. So the dark blue product speaks to the customer job. The level below, which is in the middle, is the people in your clients or the people, your customers. What are their pain points on a daily basis? What are the problems they, they deal with, the negative aspects they deal with? in trying to solve the problem which they, they, their business solves for their client, right? So what, what are the negative aspects they're trying to move on a daily basis in their business? And this is not the stuff they're paying for for you and your service, but it's some of the, the frustrations that they have. So is, is the example being that they don't have enough time or they've got to produce reports on the work that you've done for them. So what are the other things that, that, that they deal with that, that's painful? And what do you do built into your product or process that takes away that pain? And how do you make their life easier on an ongoing basis? And make sure that when you're always thinking about your product or service, that you're working out what those additional things are to make their life, those people's lives better. The layer below that, which is the final layer, which is very much around the surprise and delights, and you'll see that it says uh, MOM, it's moments of magic. What are the moments of magic, surprise and delight elements? that you could do for your customer that's not the obvious stuff. And the obvious stuff is 
birthday presents, Christmas presents, uh, roses on Valentine's. Those are additional things which no one is paying for, which is wonderful to receive as a client. But ultimately, you need to be smarter about it and do stuff that's remarkable. It's the way you package your product. It's the way you deliver your product. It's the way you engage with your clients that surprises and delights them. Um, it's not about removing pain. It's not about delivering the work they're paying for. It's what else you can do for them that, that makes you remarkable. And by remarkable, they will remark about you on fine night dinner or the Sunday lunch, right? Like, what are they telling people about? And it's very rarely the fact that you delivered a great service. It's got to do something else. It's got to do with the experience that, that you wrap that service in. So I want you to think about what does it look like today in your business? And you can see... And you will see quite quickly that you're probably quite bad at the second and third layer. At the top layer, you've probably got wax because you're in business, but the second and third are bad. And that helps you understand what does that look like from a delivery perspective in your business today that, again, needs to be changed. The next, the next uh, the, uh, exercise is the learning window. And it, it's very much around removing that legacy thinking about what, what do we think we know and the assumptions we've made that are informing our decision going forward, decision making going forward. So at, at, at every level across the business, what are the things that we absolutely are sure of, what we know? And very often people go, well, we know that this, this, and this. And when you start actually asking about this, this, and this, whatever that is in the business, you realize that they don't actually know, they're assuming. It's what we think we know that's in the next block. And the point of this is that before you start making decisions in your business to hire people, fire people, change services, decide on your marketing channel, um, decide on your geographic location, all of these things that we feel sometimes on gut feeling or we've got them with one or two conversations. We think we know what we know, but actually we, th we only sort of think we know what, 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 what those things are. So the exercise is to go through what do we know, what do we think we know, which means we need to do some more research and get some empirical evidence on what do we know we don't know? And that requires absolute research to make sure we can move that up into the, the top two layers. And then there's things which are, what are things that we've never thought about that could really, really affect our business from a risk analysis or from an opportunity perspective? And this is very broad thinking. There's a great book on black swans, which you can go and read, um, but it's, it's, and it's very difficult to, to just dump ideas there. But we, we live in the space where we think we know what we know and we believe what we know. And often all of that is just purely an assumption. So very often it's just to make sure that we're not assuming stuff about new services or new products or new direction before we're absolutely clear on the facts and have empirical evidence. Once you've got that, you can then decide which are the actions you should take in order to change our direction or not move in a particular direction. The customer avatar, which is your client base, um, there's a great way of, of looking at who are your clients today and who do you want in the future? What kind of clients do you want in the future? And then we can decide how we're going to move you across from today's clients to the future clients. And there's six sort of pieces on the left hand side that help us do that. So the first thing is it's called the queer client, nothing to do with being gay. But if you look at your client base today or the last sort of six or 12 months, and I said to you, who are your perfect clients? You could tell me who they are. And you could give me the traits or the descriptions uh, or descriptors or the sort of um, the, the reasons why they are the best kind of clients. And it's often got to do with the fact that, yes, they're paying you a good price and they pay well. well those are the obvious ones. But sometimes it's about, you know, they're, they're, they're the um, culturally, they are the right, the right fit for our business. Um, sometimes they are, um, they, they, they give us good referrals. Um, so that, like, what are the reasons why we have great clients today? Okay. Um, and then in future, what kind of clients do we want? We want all those good traits in future. And we want to be able to filter clients going forward to make sure we're bringing in better quality clients so we can keep them for longer, right? So once we understand what are these, these queer clients and the descriptors look like, we can then work out, well, what kind of, how are they segmented or how are they niched and where do they live? that we should be speaking to those kinds of people. We then decide, well, how do we find more of them? How do we keep them? How do we interact with them at every single stage of our engagement from, from sales, marketing sales, um, onboarding, delivery, and hopefully forever sort of the retention marketing piece. How do we interact with them? And do we want a lifetime value out of them? Sometimes there is a project, a project kind of client that comes in and it comes and goes, but sometimes we can have clients for many, many years and we want to make sure we want to keep them 
And we almost want to market for retention versus market for closing. So we don't want to just bring clients in and close them. We want to bring them in and keep them. All right. So the idea is to go, what do our clients look like today? You know, where do we find them? How do we keep them? How do we direct them today? And what do they look like from a lifetime value today? And in future, which elements are going to change and how should we start thinking about them differently to bring in better quality clients going forward? Um, the seven P's of marketing, another very traditional exercise. Um, we're going to shoot through it because I'm sure you've seen this before, but very simply is to analyze each of the elements of your marketing, the marketing mix as, as it's called, right? So the first thing is let's look at our product and packaging and make sure that every element of our business, um, and that's from, from, you know, everything that we deliver from a product perspective is well packaged, has been thought about carefully, has been curated, all the artifacts that we deliver around the product service are beautifully produced and delivered um, and make sure that we're thinking about it from the client perspective. Obviously, what is the client experience like when, when seeing or, or hearing about our product and the way we package our product or service? The next thing is, is our pricing. Are we, are we understanding the margins we need to achieve? What kind of pricing strategies do we actually need? How often do we put our, price, put our prices and in, in increases? Um, how do we do discounts and referrals on pricing? So understand pricing and be deliberate with pricing. Don't just thumb suck an idea of a price and start with that price to really understand what the right price is and how that positions us in the market. Are you premium or are you sort of, you know, a high volume uh, discount to some degree? Like, and that's okay either or, but be deliberate with, with your, your, your pricing decisions. And this thing is, what are all the processes that you have in your business, especially the ones that, that clients see or feel, and how does that impact your marketing? So what kind of systems do you have in place to make you, 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 you regular in delivery, that all your touch points are, are consistent, and make sure that you analyze all those processes, always starting with any client engagement first. Anything that the client sees, feels, and touches with regards to engagement with you, make sure those processes are super tight and consistent in nature. It is marketing. The next thing is your people. So if you're a one-man business, it's just you. If you've got a team, what does that team look like? From everything from how do they sign off emails? What do they wear? <clears throat> how do they present themselves? Again, at every single touch point. And how do they represent you, the business, in, at the market at large? And how do you train them to be as client-centric and client-engaging engaging as possible? The next thing is where do you deliver your services? So do you deliver services online? Are you bricks and mortar store? Do you do you know, physical delivery? Are you backdoor of a retail? Like, what does that look like? And make sure that that environment, that place, whatever that is, is, is curated and, and thought about at every single level to make sure you're delivering a, a great client experience. The next piece is where are you actually advertising and running promotion? And that's everything from, from public speaking, right through to your social channels, to your newsletters, to your email signature. Every place that you're promoting your business, what does that look like? Where should you be? And make sure that every single one of those things is congruent with the messaging you want to be putting out at that point in time. So whatever your, your campaign thinking is at that time, what is the messaging you want to be putting out? Is it true to our values? Where are we doing our promotion? And make sure that those elements are all um, in check and, and, and again, congruent to one single marketing message. And the next thing is that in terms of doing the delivery of your product, um, you may leave other physical evidence. And physical evidence are things like your invoices and statements, it is your emails, um, it can be branded stuff like books and pens and stuff, anything else that your client sees, touches and feels regarding around the engagement with you, what are those things that you should have in your business, don't have in your business, and are they up to date, do they speak to what you're trying to tell your audience? And again, let's produce some action items off the back of that and decide what are the things we need to do to improve the entire marketing mix. Once we have all of that, and there's way more exercise we could, we, could, we, could, we could layer into, but once we have all of that, what is important is that we then start defining, well, what do I, the business owner, want to achieve? That is a victory condition. <coughs> Excuse me. You normally break those down into two periods. So it's a long-term, three-year plus fluffy dream, and a, a mid-term, which is generally 12 months in, in my prescription. So the long-term dream is fluffy. It's not a measurement delivery. It's more around... You know, I'd like to be known for. I'd like to have my marketing in place. I want a, an automated system of doing X, Y, and Z. I want branches in, you know, in two cities and five countries. I want 10 staff or 100 staff. I want to be making 10 grand or 100 grand. Like, what are the, the, the sort of big, 
the big fluffy objectives that you want the business to be serving you. How many hours do I want to be working? What kind of money do I want to be taking off here? What do I want to be, be known for in the industry? So they almost some degree, I'm using it selfish, deliberately selfish objectives. What are those selfish objectives long-term? And then with a bit more meat on the bones, what are the 12-month objectives? So like in the next 12 months, how much do I want to be earning? What kind of work do I want to be doing? Um, who do I want to be engaging with? Um, how much lifestyle balance you know, do I want in my life? So write down all the things that you want to be selfish with in the business, which no one else needs to know about. And, and make sure that when we start into business goals, that they feed these shareholder victory conditions. The next level below that is talks, talks to uh, our brand, our deals. This comes directly from one of the advertising agency, which is called Ogilvy. And they have the big brand ideal, which says that, you know, Brent Spilkin believes there will be a better place if. Now, what is your big brand ideal? Like, what are you going to go to the market with? And what do you genuinely believe deep down? What are your values that you want to honor to make sure that, that your business lives up to your own personal ideals, your own brand ideals? Because you are going to be the longest probably employee in your business for, for most smaller businesses. And then if you want... Um, and I'm sure you've all seen the Simon Sinek start with why. It's understanding well, what is what is from a selfish level. Why do we exist beyond making money? You know, what contributions do I and my company want to make to the world and, and the market that we play in? Long term, my legacy. What do we want to be known for? And how do we treat people uh, with with it, whether they suppliers, our staff, or the customers at large? Um, and how, you know, is it true to my value systems? And how do we act to get things that we want out of these people? So um, there's lots you could do on, on the Simon Sinek uh, circle of, of why it's the, the why, what, and how. Um, and I always recommend that you do that at least every year or so when you're redoing your strategy, if you're doing it on an annual basis. I'm rushing through this, guys. Then the next piece is the business goals. So part of the business goals, one of the exercises you can do is a, B, is a BHAG. It comes from Jim Collins. It's the big, hairy, audacious goal. The idea is to write a headline that you want to see in a publication in a period of time ahead. And that used to be sort of 25 years. I don't believe we can see that far into the future anymore. So what does three to five years look like? What is the headline that you would see that talks to the fact that we as a business, why as a business have achieved our objectives? Now, the great example that, 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 that uh, Jim Collins speaks about was NASA. In 1963, JFK said, we're going to land a man on the moon. That was the headline, right? Like, we're going to land a man on the moon. And in 1969, the New York Times published the post saying, NASA lands man on moon. And what that speaks to, which is the subtext, is the fact that NASA were a large organization. They were well-funded. They had a lot of smart people. They were well, you know, uh, organized necessarily. They had a lot of planning, that they're, they're a powerhouse from, from, a, from a country perspective. So there's a lot of luck just reading the headline speaks to what kind of organization they were. Their publication was New York Times, and, and they said by the end of the decade, which was 69, okay? And how will you know you've succeeded? It speaks to smart goals, <coughs> excuse me, like a measurement of some sort. How do we know that we've absolutely delivered on this? So it's one of the examples that you could do is that you could work out, you know, I, I want to be known in Entrepreneur Magazine front, front page that I've done X. And the subtext would obviously be the detail of the article and by when. And it's another way of just of, of bringing your, your, all your business goals into a single piece. Not everyone loves the BHAG. And if you go through these answers, these questions here, it will help you understand you know, how to think about the BHAG and make sure that it's exciting, um, pushing the boundaries, but yet achievable to some degree. The next thing which we can, you can look at doing is to be clear on your elevator pitch, which is the Gaddy pitch. I don't know who Gaddy is, but he framed this, this three-phase approach to running your, your elevator pitch. Very simply put, when you ask most people what they do, hey, Spilly, what do you do? I'm a business coach. It doesn't tell you how to use me or what problem I solve. So it's around phrasing three through the three elements with you know how, when, what we do is in fact. And the great example, which I always talk about is Uber. So you know how when you have to call a taxi and wait for them to come and hope the guy rocks up on time and hope you've got enough cash and do I have to tip him and how do I know I can trust him and, and how do I know he's going the best route there and, and all the problems relating to the old taxi system. So you know how when, what we do is application, link to credit card, um, share your trip, safety and security, one price, you know what you're in for, no need to tip, that kind of thing. In fact, 2 billion rides. So what is the problem that you are solving? You know how when, you know how when what? What is the problem that your client has? What, what do you do in a unique way? What is in, in a unique fashion in a, in, in a USP or differentiating uh, method? that you solve 
the, that client's problem and give me case study. Case study means you've done it with global brands or 20 years or X amount of hours or give me proof that you are the right person. Maybe it's expertise that you are the right person to deliver the unique solution for the client's unique problem. And often people don't understand how to do that, but that goes back to marketing to be clear on what is it that we're going to be delivering for our clients. <clears throat> then once we have all this information, we've unpacked all these common themes, you have generally a much better understanding of what is required to move the business forward and know what those business are, the business objectives are. Now, I've used an example here where there are four key initiatives. Generally, when you do these, you get between 10 and 15 key initiatives. So like they're big things that need to happen in order for us to achieve our objective within the business. Now, you can see here that I've got four different colors of blue, but the key initiative are generally things like solve our marketing or solve our finance or get our sales processes or processes correct. So that they are big pieces which need to be unpacked in more detail. So what are the initiatives that in the next 12 months we need to do in order to achieve our objective? Once we know what those initiatives are, we'll then break them down into, uh, into, into thrusts, right? So we need, we need many thrusts to deliver on each initiative. So if we go back here, initiative one, dark blue, we have thrust, uh, we have a, a thrust one and thrust two, and often there's like 10, 15 thrusts per initiative, and those are for the first quarter. So what are we doing in the first three months of this 12 month plan that we can actually start delivering in our business. And each of those initiatives have multiple thrusts. And again, you may have 10 initiatives. If each initiative has 10 thrusts, you're sitting with hundred things that need to be done. And that's when you need to filter out the information because there's too much to be done. So we wanna take all of these initiatives and they're in detail. So sort out finance mean hire a finance person, use different software, uh, train the finance people, put in uh, terms and conditions. Those are all thrusts of the initiative sort out finance. Once we've got that, <clears throat> we can then decide realistically, if we do that work, will it give us high impact results and how much effort will it take to do? Now, anything that is low impact and low effort, bottom left-hand quadrant, you probably shouldn't be focusing or, or even doing at all as part of your strategy. You want to be spending as much time on the low effort, high impact, top left-hand corner. So you take those 100 cards, you put them out on these four quadrants and then realize which pieces you can start with, which pieces you're gonna then pause for later. Once you know that, you're then gonna take each of those, uh, those thrusts and break them down uh, from the, so you have initiative broken down to quarterly thrusts, you then take those quarterly thrusts and break them down into, into actual sprints. And sprints is the actual work you're going to do. It's pick up the phone, get quotes, push out this post, you know, send this person an email, uh, write this proposal, whatever it is you need to do. It's the actual work that needs to be done on a week-to-week -week basis. And generally what you can do is if you think of uh, initiatives in 12 months, thrusts in three months, sprints you can think about in 12 weeks. So over the next 12 weeks, what am I going to do one thing a week on each of the initiatives over the next 12 weeks to push the business forward? And this is the tangible plan. Like this is writing out in detail who's going to do what, how are we going to do it? When are we going to do it? What resources are required to do it? And go and actually do the work that needs to be done. We then want to make sure that every month or every two weeks or once a quarter, we check in on the strategy and we check in on each initiative to make sure that we're doing the work we said we'd do. And if we're completing it, is it giving us the results we'd hoped to achieve? And if not, how do we stop doing it or adjust or panel beat some of those initiatives, thrusts and sprints to make sure that we are moving the business forward. So we want to make sure we're controlling and measuring each element of the strategy going forward. Again, it's a plan. Once we start with it, it's going to change and it must be make sure that when we go and we start measuring and realigning the strategy, we're comfortable realigning and moving the strategy. So I've spent 15 minutes racing through this. Um, you're all going to get a copy of this and there's a bit of detail in there for you to work through. I'm more than happy for you guys to reach out uh, I'm sure Tracy or someone will share my email address with you. I'm more than happy if you guys want to reach out to me. If you've got any questions around this, I'm more than happy to help you know, unpack some of the elements around this. But the important piece for me is very much around understanding that, that, that nitty gritty, what are we doing the next 12 weeks? And making sure that we have a plan that on Monday morning we wake up and we know outside of doing the work in our business, that's dealing with the production and the clients and everything we normally do. What are the things that how much time and what are the things we're doing focusing on 
building out the strategy to move the business forward. I want to make sure that you always have a detailed plan at the bottom and don't just live in the, I have an idea, I'm going to try and do this and I'm going to try and do that. So key lessons, don't assume anything. Make sure you do the research. Make sure your objectives are, are pushing boundaries, but to some degree realistic. Think long-term selfishly, mid-term around the business, short-term do the work and the actions that need to be done. So I'm going to leave you there. Um, and I'm more than, more than happy to, to deal with any questions you have. Please feel free to shout. Are there any questions for Brent before we close today? Sure, Brent, you make it sound so so easy, so simple, and so straightforward. But when you through your through your chat.